Thank you, Professor uh, Pinkas, and uh, I would like uh, uh, to invite uh, immediately our next uh, speaker, Professor uh, Yunda, Yuda Lindel, uh, also from uh, Bar-Ilan University. Uh, Professor Lindel is the Computer Science Department at uh, Bar-Ilan University. Uh, he is a Raviv Fellow uh, at the, he was a Raviv Fellow at the IBM uh, Watson Research Center from uh, 2002 to 2004. Uh, you the researchers both the uh, theoretic and applied aspects of uh, a crypto cryptography with the focus uh, on secure uh, two-party and multi-party computations. Please, Professor Linde. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a very specific problem at a nice combinatorical problem that happens to have some very uh, significant ramifications to making things practical. So it's sort of a nice combination of things. The setting I'm going to consider is secure multi-party computation. Benny mentioned it a few minutes ago. Uh, we want to compute uh, without revealing uh, our inputs. So we want to. Uh, we have a number of parties who want to compute some joint function of their inputs. Uh, they want to preserve privacy, which means that only the output will be, will be revealed and nothing else. And correctness, meaning that uh, a malicious party can't somehow uh, cause the result to be uh, other than uh, uh, a valid uh, computation of the function. And uh, these properties should be guaranteed even if the parties uh, behave maliciously or, or adversarially. In particular, I'm going to focus on maliciously, which means that they can essentially do anything uh, that they want to deviate from the protocol in, a, in their attempt to break the protocol, which is what we expect from most advers adversaries in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about garbled circuits, but I'm not going to go into how garbled circuits are built. I'm just going to tell you what they are. So a garbled circuit is an encrypted circuit, and uh, it has garbled input keys. So instead of having regular 0, 1 inputs or regular string for input, you give it sort of random keys that represent input values that you may not even know. And when you've given a set of these input keys, you're actually able to compute this garbled circuit and get valid output without learning anything whatsoever about what you computed. So you can think of it as this black box. Um, you can actually think of it like an, office, an obfuscation, but it's a provably secure, very efficient obfuscation. The reason why it's an obfuscation is because it can only be used once. Once you use it once, you have to throw it out. So we can use it for this type of setting where we have an interaction between parties to compute without revealing anything, because one of the parties can provide these keys and the other party can do the computation, or these keys can actually be uh, some of them related to the first party's input and some related to the second party's input. But the, all you need to really uh, uh, think about is that we have this very, very efficient box and we can actually do very efficient computations inside this box without revealing anything that goes on inside. And that makes sense on an intuitive level of how we can compute without revealing anything. So what's the, uh, okay, so this is how we could use it. One party would build this garbled circuit and send it to the other. The other party will obtain the garbled keys that relate to its input and the first party's input. will then compute this box and get the output. Uh, the second party who's computing it doesn't know anything because the box is a black box. And the first party didn't even see anything about the computation, so he also didn't learn anything. So nothing is learned but the output, and everyone's happy. The problem that I want to talk about is what happens when, one of the, when the parties can be malicious, which is what I expect them to be typically. The big problem is that the party who constructs this circuit may not construct it correctly. And because this circuit is inside this black box, we actually have no idea what's inside. So instead of computing the correct function, the first party can put something inside that computes something else, which firstly, if it's an incorrect function, then it will uh, compute something else. So if Benny wants to use this to compute the set intersection of uh, these, uh, uh, say, of our contacts, instead the function can compute, uh, say, uh, uh, some check if there are some very interesting uh, uh, people on your contacts list and return that instead. And you'll actually have no idea that it's computing something completely different and it's revealing very important information. Or, for example, if we're using this to compare genomes for some uh, uh, medical application that we want to preserve, preserve privacy about, then instead of actually computing the correct function, we can sort of, the, this malicious party can encode information about, you know, does this person have this, uh, some certain mutation or, or some uh, tendency to a certain illness and somehow reveal that from the computation even though he's not supposed to. So we, we have this wonderful black box, but we don't know 
whether it's actually correctly constructed. And because of black box, we have no way of even detecting that we've got something which is bad. So how can we pr solve this problem and actually use this nice black box uh, and guarantee that we're getting the right thing? So the main idea, the idea is called something called cut and choose. What's cut and choose? The first party will prepare many circuits, many of these black boxes, and send them to the other party. And the other party will now ask to open half of them. This is like a general technique. How can we uh, check that someone is behaving uh, uh, reasonably? We can ask them to open half of the things that they pre prepared. And we can check if, uh, if they're all good. And if they're all good, then we, we have a very good guarantee or understanding that actually the rest of them will be good. We made all of them, but the vast majority of the rest of them will also be good. Because if there were many bad circuits, then by opening a random half of them, we'll, we'll, catch, we'll uh, detect this cheating with very, very high probability. And, but because we can't be guaranteed that all of the circuits that are remain are good, but just the, the most of them are, we take the majority output, because we may actually get different outputs, because some of them may be good and some may be bad, so we'll get different results from the computation. Just by the way, you might be thinking, one second, but if I get different results from the computation, then I know the other guy is cheating, so I'll just stop. Actually, if you do that, then you, reveal, you can reveal information so you're not allowed to. This is actually a sort of a bad side effect that even if you know someone's a cheat, you can't, you can't actually tell them that. You have to play as if you didn't notice. But the idea is we have this, uh, we have this method. We take the majority result, and we're all fine. So what's the comb combinatorical question? The question is how many circuits do I need to actually construct to make sure that I get the majority remaining being good with very high probability. And this question actually has a huge ramification on practice because these garbled circuits actually are very efficient when I use one of them. But if I have to use hundreds of them to do a computation, then uh, they'll become very, very inefficient. So uh, getting this uh, right and working on uh, getting the number of circuits down is a very, very important research problem that uh, has been, we've been working on for the last 10 years or so. And we've made actually very, very significant progress, which is what enables us to actually use these things uh, uh, practically now. So if I do the first thing which I would do, which is a, as a computer scientist, I would use a general probabilistic bound called Chernoff, then what will happen is that in order to get, for example, an error of 2 to the minus 40, which is a very, very small error, I'll need 680 circuits. And that's really, really bad. All right, that's horrible. Um, and that was actually what we did in 2007 because we, we didn't fully appreciate the, the ramification of, how t of the tightness of this bound to, this, to the efficiency of the protocol. And, but we did uh, uh, conjecture that it was actually 2 to the minus s over 4, so 160 would be enough. And why did we do that? Because um, if you think about it, it has to be we're opening, we have s circuits, we're opening a half of them, and we need that the majority remaining will be good. So, so the adversary will win if there are a quarter of the circuits are bad, and, but none of them are opened. So if you were to open each circuit with probability 1 half, and you need that S over 4 will not be opened, a specific, a specific S over 4, then you have probability 2 to the minus S over 4. So you'd need 160 circuits to get 2 to the minus 40. So you have this, uh, uh, this calculation, but this is not an accurate calculation because we're opening half. We're not ch opening each one separately with probability 1 half. We're opening a half. So we actually have a very different combinatorical game. And it's not 160 circuits we need. When you do an accurate calculation, and here working very, very hard to get it really right because it has a ramification on the, secure, on, on the, sec, on the efficiency, then we get this uh, horrible sort of looking equation, but it comes down to 2 to the minus 0.311s when you do an approximation, and it gets to we need 128. So 128 is significantly better than 680, which is what we started with, but it's still pretty bad. So uh, Shen and Shalat uh, in 2011 actually showed that if you open 60% and open, open 50%, then you can do better and you can get it down to 125. Not great. The bad news actually is they showed that it's optimal. They showed that you can't do better within this strategy than 125 circuits. And that's really bad because 125 is, is, is not a happy situation. So what do you do when you get uh, you run into a wall, when you run into a, a lower bound, you change the playing field. Okay? So you change, you change the method that you're actually using to, uh, to, to, to guarantee correctness. And instead of requiring that a majority will be good, 
We uh, changed the protocol so diversity can only win if all of the unopened boxes are bad. How we do that is, a, is, is out of the scope of this talk, but we change the playing field so the diversity only wins if all of the unopened boxes are bad. And what that means is that, well, we open a certain set of the, these boxes and they all have to be correct. The diversity will only win if all the remaining ones are bad. That means there's only one specific opening of the, of, of the boxes that will allow the diversity to win. That's if I open all the good and I leave all the bad. Now if I open each box with probability one half independently, then there's just one opening, there's only one good subset, so it's with 2 to the minus s. And now I go down to only 40 boxes. This already sounds much, much better. So I went from 680 to 128 to 40. That's already starting to sound good, but I'm still not happy. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do is, is, again, further change the game and think about what happens if I want to run many executions, which will typically be what will happen in many cases in practice. We'll have, say, a client and a server running many executions or two different servers running together. Maybe we can now prepare a whole lot of boxes ahead of time and somehow utilize that we have you know, some law of large numbers somewhere. So what we'll do is we'll have the first party prepare many, many boxes, and we'll open a percentage and check them just like beforehand. And if all of them are good, then instead of just taking the remainder, we're going to throw the remainder randomly into different buckets. And using the same principles beforehand, the adversary will only win if one of the buckets is all bad. But this is much harder for the adversary because now we've randomly permuted things. So if we have many, many circuits and we're throwing them to random buckets, a bucket will have only really bad, all, all bad circuits if uh, the adversary made many of the circuits bad to start with. But if it made many of the circuits bad to start with, then we'll catch it with high probability. So it really makes it much, much harder for the adversary. And, uh, and this, this mixing, this random permutation added on top, and just to show you how much harder, even if I just do 32 executions, so I'm not even batching many ahead of time, actually what we do is we get down to an average of 13 uh, circuits is all that we need overall. So actually we check uh, 3.34 and we leave 10, we're checking 25%. If we do 1,000, then we get down to 7. If we do a million, we get down to 4. So actually by batching a lot, and this is actually a lot of uh, uh, quite a difficult combinatorical analysis to get it down to, this, to, to as optimal as possible. And, uh, and what we end up getting is that actually you can pr prevent malicious activity with only a very uh, small overhead of one, four or, four or seven circuits per execution. And this is actually very close to what we call the semi-honest security level where you only need one. So you can get malicious security prevent uh, the adversary from giving you bad boxes and competing incorrect function with actually not such high cost. And that's essentially the story of garbled circuits and secure computation in the malicious setting, uh, uh, at least using, using garbled circuits over the last decade, and what's brought us from something which is a purely theoretical object to something which actually is now being deployed in, uh, uh, in, in a number of academic, many academic projects, but also in... in uh, um, uh, real-world systems as well today. So uh, in summary, this is a, a sort of a b very basic combinatorial problem, a question of you know, buckets and, uh, and uh, balls and buckets and throwing and finding, uh, uh, trying to detect a bad ball by, by, by checking uh, some subset of them and, and, uh, and getting security out of, this sort of, out of this problem. And what's nice about it is that uh, doing it optimally actually has enabled us to make, make things efficient and practical. Just want to note there are many other issues in, in getting these protocols to be secure. I just focused on one, but something which I think sheds light on, on what we're doing. Thank you.